you guys um, and obviously thank you for um, you know attending today's webinar um, just a brief overview of kind of what to expect as part of this we'll be just talking about some of the productivity comparisons between um, the sort of different operating systems um, you know looking at you know ways of consuming these kind of new feature sets within Windows 10 the differences in managing the two some considerations around that um, the hardware requirements, as you'd expect, user adoption and familiarity, um, and then obviously, you know, just some of those extra bits to consider, um, obviously, going on your Windows 10 journey as such. Um, so uh, my name is um, Heinrich Kelser. Um, I, work as, I work for Power on Platforms. Um, I'm part of the solutions team here. Uh, my job primarily is just to help uh, more than anything else, um, as well as to kind of offer advice and guidance, obviously, wherever I can. Um, so I hope this session is always useful for that. A quick introduction into PowerOn. Um, we are a Microsoft Gold partner, as well as an EMNS Elite partner. Um, we've also got a couple of Microsoft MVPs into the ranks, um, as well as some of the clients, as you can see down the bottom there. The organization that I work for is effectively split into two sort of main focus areas, product solutions, consultancy services. On the product side, uh, we've developed um, a couple of bits and pieces in order to effectively help a guide and assist um, some of the offerings that we obviously bring to market. The first one, most sort of prominent one of that being Pulse Device Management and Security, which is a way of leveraging Configuration Manager in Azure. Uh, we also have a Pulse um, op Operational Monitoring um, capability as well, which is a way of obviously monitoring on-premise services from the cloud. Camino Automated Deployment, which is um, our way of obviously just, um, ramping up and fast-tracking those services and deployments of things like System Center as well as then things like any specialist packages around NCSE compliance, WIM as a service, and some other bits and pieces there as well. Um, we focus across four areas on the consultancy side of things, the modern workplace, as we're talking about here, um, IT service management integration, as well as the cloud platform. And we've also kind of been developing and working closely with a lot of organizations around something referred to as smart teaming. Um, and in a nutshell, that's an extension of your IT function in order to sort of cater and alleviate some of the pressures that come with Windows 10. Um, so I wanted to kind of uh, sort of jump in very quickly into this Windows 10 versus Windows 7 discussion. Um, as you'd imagine, Windows 10 is something that's, you know, say new. It's the newest version of the operating system that Microsoft has given us, and its predecessor was Windows 8.1. However, the sort of large majority of the market share um, still sits on um, that Windows 7 platform at the moment, right? Um, so as you can sort of see from a comparative side of things, one of the big things that comes with Windows 10 these days, and it's such a generic term, is something like speed, all right? The architecture of that operating system has been kind of redesigned to work very well um, on, and obviously optimize on existing hardware, all right? Um, as you would imagine with something like Windows 7, it's something that's depreciating day by day. And obviously with things like end of life coming soon as well, um, we're just seeing more and more and more being applied to that operating system um, in order to well, effectively keep it up to date as such. And we'll see that kind of tail off towards um, you know, the sort of latter part of next year, I would, I would suspect. Um, some of the productivity bits and pieces within Windows 10 that Microsoft sort of tend to make a big deal about um, is around things like support for multiple desktops from a how you use Windows 10 perspective. Windows 7 just had the one. Ink, which is a nice way of working as well, um, has also been kind of, you know, something we saw, saw integrated loosely within Windows 8. It's really been enhanced and obviously focused on. Um, around the Windows 10 space as well. And then all the other bits and pieces you would expect from Cortana to search, um, some of the bits and pieces that are quite static in the Windows 7 world has been kind of very much opened up for these modern apps and modern kind of like experiences with this Windows 10 desktop. All right. Um, one of the big things we've also seen as part of this Windows 10 journey, um, and talking about the kind of iterative release cycle, all right, and where the world is changing, kind of the full, sort of future vision of um, running Windows 10 in an organization from a project's perspective typically looked like this, all right? So you could see that there was huge spikes um, sort of when you're introducing one OS to another. So going from Windows X to Windows XP, from Windows 7 to Windows 8, and then obviously as you'd expect with Windows 10. And one of the big things to cater for is that these projects are typically quite disruptive Right? Um, and the reason for that is, is because we're introducing a massive amount of change every time we go from one operating system to the next. Um, so the idea typically was to kind of hone everything and get everything ready for, for a Windows 7 project, for example, a Windows 8 project, for example, have a massive ramp up in change to the organization, and then say for sort of fairly static as part of that. Right? With Windows 10, the conversation is slightly different. So you will have an initial spike going from one operating system to the next, right? but then that disruption and change is something that's a continual 
process as part of that. Now, I know that sounds kind of, um, you know, a little bit worrying or disruption and change is something that we have to worry about forever now. Um, but it's effectively continual change that you're introducing at a sort of staggered rate and a phased approach more than anything. Right? And typically those earlier days of running Windows 7 projects and everything else was a sort of a process, not a project mindset, as you'd expect. However, moving forward, it's going to be very much a kind of a process mindset these days anyway. Right? Um, one of the biggest changes from what we've seen from Windows 7, hopping obviously over to things like um, Windows 10 is this thing referred to as Windows as a service. You know, what is it? How does it work? What do I need to think about? All right. Um, <clears throat> this is a very good representation as to how that service is introduced and Microsoft's vision of obviously the future. All right. Um, so that first gray side on the left hand side there, which refers to the Windows Insider program, is a large collection of community members. I would also encourage people within organizations to adopt this as part of the Windows Insider program to kind of get those early releases of the Windows operating system into an organization. Right? Following on from that, once all that feedback and everything has been collated and passed back to Microsoft, they take all those changes and turn that into what is referred to as current branch of Windows 10. Right? Currently we're sitting, I think it's 1803, this latest version of that. Right? Then most organizations would tend to pilot that. Right? And then as you would expect, once it's released into current branch for business over the space of typically 12 to 18 or even 22 months periods of time, then that level of Windows 10 is then introduced into the organization, right? So you can see it's a phased approach over a period of time, a year or so, in which things are obviously introduced. And then the process repeats itself, basically. So gone are the days of going from Windows 10. There will be no Windows 11 or 12, as far as we're aware at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of continual cycle of change is something to bear in mind, obviously, when going down the road of Windows 10. The main idea behind this, as you would expect, is obviously to stay current, right? And the way we kind of, or the way Microsoft released these updates are referred to as a semi-annual change or semi-annual channel update. So quite recently, we had Windows 10 1709. Um, and for those who don't know, 1709 and the numbers after Windows 10 is the American date format. So 1709 would be September 2017, April 2018, September 2018, and so forth. Um, and it's effectively every six months or so. Right now, as you can see, these things are staggered, and this will be the kind of continual perpetual motion, all right, that we can plan for in aid of obviously adopting something such as Windows 10. So you can see that that's one of the bigger differences between this Windows 7 platform and the Windows 10 platform is this perpetual motion of obviously change. And then, so as I said, the sort of main idea behind this is staying current, and this is typically how we see organisations adopt the different various Windows 10 offerings, as you might see, right? So you have about an 18-month window as such to jump from one to the other. There is no hard requirement, I suppose, to jump from one to the other. It's around obviously making sure you stay supported, right? And the way that these decisions are made and helped with as well are things like analytics, as you would expect. So you can sort of see what your environment looks like right now, right? And then from there, very quickly hop from one version Windows 10 to the other in a phased approach. Now, there are obviously different ways of managing that, which we'll obviously talk about. But I just wanted to get it clear that the mindset of obviously going from one version of Windows to another is something that needs to be incorporated into effectively the project lifecycle these days. It's no longer just applying something, stopping, waiting for the next release, and going from there. These changes are being introduced at a much higher rate. Um, one of the biggest things we tend to talk about and contend with as well, right? Are things, for example, such as, you know, what does the hardware requirements have to be? Um, because sometimes people, uh, organizations tend to kind of run these Windows 10 projects in conjunction or as part of a hardware refresh program. As you can see here, the sort of core hardware for 7 and 10 is fundamentally still the same, right? They've not actually upped that. Um, so anyone who's ever had to do with something like Windows Vista quickly realized that there's a massive jump in hardware requirements that needed to happen as well. But for Windows 7, for Windows 8, and for Windows 10 as well, these have pretty much stayed the same. Right? There are some considerations around the hardware stack that needs to be taken into account for some of those advanced security feature sets. So things like um, UEFI Secure Boot, Device Guard, Credential Guard, and something referred to as conditional access um, has a dependency on the TPM 2.0. Right, and UEFI boot list, I think that's typically the next iteration of hardware anyway. One thing to bear in mind as part of this, this is a hardware spec. This may not account for things like driver support as well as vendor support. Um, but as you can see from a hardware adoption perspective, um, running Windows 10 is something that you can kind of do still on legacy hardware. Right, that's definitely the way to go. 
when it comes to some of the, I suppose, the features and some of the challenges, right, of um, kind of adopting where Windows 7 started, it, it's a continual process, as you would expect, right? So we had good device protection, threat resistant, identity protection, something's been introduced, information protection, and this is where Windows 7 got the ball rolling on some of those things. And at the time, it was extremely robust in exactly what the enterprise market or SMEs were asking for. Um, we could use things like Windows Update. TPMs were nice to have as well because then we could start leveraging things like BitLocker, all right, if you had an enterprise level of Windows 7, all right, BitLocker to go, MBAM, all those things started taking part in it. And then from there, we saw that, okay, what's next? So this is kind of the feature sets that have been enhanced and added to. Right? So we've now got things like Trusted Boot. Windows Defender and Edge have been massively ramped up and is now sort of part of the package of Windows 10. Right? Things like Windows Hello. So it's a different way of authenticating. The idea behind that is it's a more secure way of authenticating. It's getting rid of passwords using biometrics, fingerprints, facial recognitions, um, and so forth. Right? Um, and then as well, things like Windows Information Protection. So the sort of idea around sort of um, security in the Windows 10 world has shifted very much from, okay, we know we need to secure the device, but do we need to look at the information as part of that as well? And how can we make that native as part of the offering? All right? And on top of that, with the sort of um, upper echelons of some of the hardware capabilities, as you can see there, kind of taking back what we spoke to earlier on the modern hardware, we, th we see things like, you know, secure boot device guard, credential guard, conditional access and security management obviously falling part of that stack, all right? So it's a continual thing that is kind of being, you know, perpetuated throughout the sort of life cycle of any Windows 10 device as well, okay? Now, one of the biggest things to kind of look at there towards the right-hand side is that breach protection. Um, Windows ATP or Advanced Threat Protection is something we're seeing um, heavily leveraged these days. Um, I know that in the uh, certain areas of the public sector, this is something that's becoming more and more prominent um, as well. And the reason for that is to kind of look at things like post breach. Right? So we're very good at securing things at the front door, but we also need to make sure, okay, well, once we have a breach, right, how do we manage it? How do we maintain that? Right? Um, and Microsoft released some stats not that long ago to sort of explain you know, post breaches a virus or a sort of issue can sort of sit in your environment for months and no one in IT is aware of it. Obviously, things like ATP and so forth look to mitigate that, to quarantine, bring that to your attention so you can act on it, right? as well as then leveraging everything else from a security stack as well. Identifying the right tools for maintaining Windows, um, I think is also quite an important discussion to have and understand. Um, we sort of see a lot of organizations tend to lean towards things like, um, as you'd expect there, WSUS, an old favorite, Windows Update for Business being a more of a cloud-driven solution, right? Um, Windows Updates for Business um, is, is something I'll, I'll touch on as well. But we saw seeing these things move away from um, definitely like a kind of hopeful approach at times into more of a kind of refined process driven it's part of the sort of service that it offering these days so windows update is the only way to kind of patch devices for windows 10 home as you would expect right windows updates for business is cloud driven so it's feature updates so the the conversation you're having there is much more of a straightforward one which is the next slide which i'll cover off as well as then some of the traditional methods of obviously keeping and maintaining windows 10 and driving that as a service forward right it's through things like native wsus we then see that heavily leveraged with System Center Configuration Manager these days as well to kind of be able to provide that level of service as well as levels of security around the patching side of things in an automated fashion. Okay, so something that's being introduced more and more and more into sort of um, environments these days. All right, so it's making sure that there's a couple of ways of going about upgrading and also maintaining Windows 7 and 10, as you would expect, but the sort of perpetual motion of change with Windows 10 is something that we can also cater for as part of this. Right. So effectively, the conversation you need to have around things like Windows Update for Business, right, um, is that it's it's a cloud service, as you'd expect, right? Um, it can be configured a couple of ways. And effectively, the um, sort of settings you're, you're asking for is, I would like the next version of Windows 10, whatever that may be, in 60 days, 80 days, 90 days, 100 days, or whatever the case may be, right? So you can then very quickly start staggering those distributions of the Windows 10 versions or upgrades or tranches of Windows 10, whichever you prefer, right? And the nice thing about this is that it can be pushed and driven through sort of things like group policy, MDM services. This isn't native to something like Intune on the MNS stack, as well as then things like configuration manager, right? Um, and then where we kind of 
look to kind of make sure that we're doing everything in a consistent way, we then start leveraging things like, as you see there, Windows Analytics for compliance reporting. So as you would expect, with anything you upgrade and move forward with, you wish to have a certain baseline of Windows updates in play in order to make sure the levels of disruption are minimized wherever possible. Right? So as part of that, we can leverage things like Windows Analytics. So obviously go ahead and patch that for you. Right? Things like Configuration Manager is, plays a massive part in that perpetual motion of managing Windows 10. Right? Um, it's typically referred to as servicing rings. Right? So there's a couple of ways of doing that. The nice thing about Windows 10 servicing rings is that it makes some assumption that the device is already on 10 and you can manage that device moving forward. All right. um, the other thing to bear in mind there as well is that you can also leverage something referred to as task sequence servicing all right, for additional controls over features and update deployment processes. So we can hone that and aim that at a specific subset of devices that we wish to upgrade from one version to another of either 7 or to 10. Um, the thing to bear in mind there, and it's just food for thought more than anything, going down that road is that it leverages the actual ISO media, the Windows 10 media, which can be anything of upwards to four gig or so. Right? So it's just something to bear in mind. So we typically see people lean towards that Windows 10 servicing model, whereby we deploy it slightly smaller anyway, and then from there, you can go ahead and upgrade. And as you would imagine, all of these things can be leveraged with all of the native capabilities to say that, okay, how, what, what, what baselines have we set for our Windows 10 devices with regards to patch compliance, application compliance, and so forth. Do any of those fall in line with our BAU testing that we've confirmed? Yes, okay, by all means, then we can go ahead and slowly but surely start to drive the change forward. One of the big conversations um, I also tend to have a lot of the time is around um, special purpose devices or referred to as LTSB or LTSC, um, which stands for the long-term servicing channel or long-term servicing branch, right? Um, this was typically seen as the answer for avoiding that perpetual change, that constant change that's being introduced with something like Windows as a service. Right? The way I would break these two down um, from a Windows current branch, a current branch for business or long-term servicing channel for business, that sort of um, general purpose device, and then for special non-purpose devices, there's a clear split between the two. So we typically see LTSB being used for non-general purpose devices. You can, you can look at that in a couple of ways as any device that requires little to no change falls into that category. Anywhere where you do not need Microsoft Office installed falls into that category. All right. I've even heard it re referred to as the sort of uh, a loose replacement for Windows embedded, which it definitely is as well. All right. Um, and then also looking at things like general purpose device managing that slightly differently, right? because you want to keep up to date, not just from a security side of things, but also a feature set side of things as well, with leveraging something like Windows 10 as well. Right? <clears throat> so this is that long-term servicing channel. right? And as I said there, it's provided to Microsoft's sort of way of interpreting this is, is, is for two different audiences, as you, if, if, if you wish. So IoT enterprise devices, right? Um, system builders, OEM builds, special purpose devices, limited use, things we don't have a lot of change, either something like a screen or a monitor or a clinical system, maybe, if you wish. Um, and then the, and the other side of that as well is for enterprise organizations with special purpose IoT needs, right? So we see that as a, either a kiosk system or something like that. Um, as well. So that's a good place for something like the long-term servicing channel to fall into play for because it requires little to no change over a long period of time. Right? The next release of that we expect in order for you to stay up to date, there's been previous iterations of it, is around um, 2019, give or take, uh, is when we've kind of seen the next version of that. Right? Um, and as I said, it's designed for um, systems and for um, situations where you require little to no change. Right? And some of the bits that have been depreciated and obviously removed from that right, um, are things like Microsoft Edge, Cortana, the store, any of those modern apps you wish to make use of as well. Right? Um, so I appreciate that obviously there, there's, there's a lot of content and stuff within this, and I wanted to kind of leave five or so minutes, I think we're about 25 past now, five or so minutes for any um, questions or anything like that as well. So um, any questions you guys want to talk about? Any Anything there so far? Craig, I can't see the other screen. I do apologize. Yeah, no, no problem. There's no questions. So 
Any questions at all? I'll tell you as a note. <laughs> No, I don't think so. Um, Heinrich, did you want to cover the, the offer that we were making to people who were attending today's webinar to go into more uh, yeah. details? Yeah, uh, not a problem. And, and, and just yeah. to, just before you do that, I mean, just, just to say if anyone has any questions that you want to ask now, um, you know, feel free to come, come back to your Phoenix account manager. Um, we're happy to pick these up offline. Um, equally, uh, if you've got any questions that might relate to your specific vertical or, or organization, I'm happy to pick those up too. Um, but Heinrich is going to cover the, the, the offer. Again, if you wish to take us up on, on this, um, please get in touch with your account manager. Um, yeah, of course, um, we'd be more than happy to help with, um, with, with anything you guys want to talk about. I, I, said, I appreciate there's obviously a lot to take in there. I um, just wanted to effectively set the scene for some of the changes that um, need to be thought about as part of this Windows 10 delivery. Cool. Okay. So if there's no questions, then we will close the webinar. Uh, a recording will be made available as well. Um, if you want to pass it on to your colleagues or, or refer back to anything that, that Heinrich has covered um, earlier in the, in the webinar. So thanks again for joining and look forward to seeing you all soon.